we, uh, let's open our Bible, shall we? How about that? <laughs> open your Bible to the uh, Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. And uh, we'll also have some, uh, some goodies for everybody afterwards. And I want to encourage you, church family, uh, if someone was up here and they, and they uh, shared their testimony and really touched you, then afterwards find them and let them know that what they had to share really blessed you and then ask to pray for them. How does that sound? So, all right, we're in Luke chapter 19, and let's read through verses 28 through 38. And I'm calling this devotional time, The Real Kingdom and King. Luke 19, 28. When he, Jesus, had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he drew near to Beth. A G in Bethany at the Mount of Olivet that he sent two of his disciples saying go into the village opposite you where as you enter you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat loose it and bring it here and if anyone asks you why are you loosing it Thus you shall say to them, Because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owner of it said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? They answered, The Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus. And they threw their own clothes on the colt. And they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen saying blessed is the king who comes in the name of the lord peace in heaven and glory in the highest the word of the lord why don't you join me in a word of prayer father i thank you so much lord this uh evening has been so filling to us so far but Father, you know that I believe in my heart that the main course is always the Word of God. And so Lord, I pray that you would light up your Word again to us. I pray, Father, that it would feed us. I pray, Father, that it would encourage us, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you know exactly what each one of us needs. And that, Lord, you would speak through your Word just what each one of us individually needs to hear. We pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name and all my dear brothers and sisters say. Amen. All right, church, let's talk a little bit about the significance of what we celebrate as Palm Sunday. And of course, we, when we talk about Palm Sunday, we're actually talking about this triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. I don't know that we can picture it. We're told that this is the time of the Passover, so... This little city of Jerusalem could have swollen to two million, maybe two and a half million people. And I believe that a lot of people were there just to see Jesus, just to see what he would do, just to see what miracle might happen next. And as had been predicted, everybody was there and they began to just throw their coats and their clothes and their palm branches and they were shouting Hosanna. Who can tell me what Hosanna means? means save now. Save us right now. Right now is the time of salvation. Right now God wants to do a work. You don't have to twist God's arm to touch your life. He doesn't play hide and seek with people. He's right there every time you call on him. And Jesus says this wonderful thing. Anybody who comes to me, I will in no wise turn away. How do you like that? I don't got to clean myself up. I don't got to. I don't got to memorize something. I don't even have to wear a tie. I could just come, just as I am, and Jesus will receive me. 
That's, that's most beautiful. You know, one of the things I enjoy most about, well, there's so many things I enjoy about Teen Challenge, but let me tell you uh, one of them that stands out in my own heart and life. And that is, when you come to Teen Challenge, they don't say, all right, you've got to follow these uh, guidelines in order to really know God. You've got to follow these steps, and we're going to go through these steps, and you're going to memorize these steps. And you know what I find? I find that the real goal of Teen Challenge is to get you to meet somebody. They want you to meet Jesus. Because if you meet Jesus, how could you not be changed? How could you not be changed by spending time with Jesus? I find that sometimes, you know, we've got these temptations, and we all do. Somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> by the way, did you know we're all addicted to sin? We're all addicts, every one of us. We're always trying to tell our flesh, no, no, no. <laughs> Follow the Lord. But I find that as you meet Jesus, you will be changed because it's, to me, personally in my life, it's not me doing battle with whatever it is that tempts me. What it is that brings me victory is clinging to Jesus. If I'm with Jesus, that's where the freedom is. If I'm with Jesus, that's where the victory is. I'm not like, I'm not like toughing it out. Like I really gotta, I really gotta fight sin. No, I really gotta be with Jesus. Remember the guy at the Gadarenes, you know, uh, the demoniac, you know. Jesus cast those uh, demons out, you know, and they sent him into the pigs. Remember, and the pigs thought they could fly off that cliff, you know. And. Uh, the next time that the town sees that fella who was called the man of the tombs, he was sitting with Jesus in his right mind. The guy could of himself not break the chains that they tried to bind him with. The man of himself could not make himself right. But what made him right was not his fight, but his surrender to Jesus. And when he surrendered to Jesus, boom, he was in his right mind. And what does the right mind look like? The right mind is somebody, in fact, let me just tell you. You want to know what somebody is who's really healthy in their thinking? The person who's really right in their mind is somebody who knows who God is and knows who they are and who knows who they are in relationship to God. That's healthy. That's a right mind. Amen. Being humble before your God. Which, by the way, is, doesn't fit into this account at all. That was uh, extra credit material. <laughs> and uh, there won't be, well, there will be a quiz afterwards, won't there? <laughs> right. Always is. This is one of the few accounts, the triumphal entry, that is listed in all four of the Gospels. And as you put them all together, the four of them, Matthew's account, Mark, Luke, and John, you find that this was a very weighty event, not only for the people that were there, but it's also a very weighty event for us. Sometimes we have heard so many accounts year after year of the triumphal entry that we may brush it off and I don't want you to do that tonight. Feel free to act like you've never heard it before. Feel free to consider that you're in a hot air balloon and you're floating above Jerusalem and Jesus is coming riding in and you get to watch the whole scene, the whole panorama. You get to watch the Roman soldiers who are scratching their heads. What in the world is this about? You get to see the religious leaders who are making those faces like, who does he think he is? You're watching the disciples as they are, I think, in shock. You're watching the people as they begin to worship out loud. Don't you think it's wonderful? 
To be able to see Jesus worship for who he really is. For people to absolutely ignore everybody around them and just praise God. You know, the ancient rabbis used to say that the highest calling of humanity is to worship God. That for a person to literally let themselves go and abandon themselves in worship to God is the pinnacle of humanity. Is that something? I agree with that. And that's what was happening all over the place. Uh, one of the accounts, and I think it might have been, I think it might have been Matthew. The uh, Greek word that's used when he talked about what was going on in the city when Jesus was riding in, he uses a Greek word which means seismic. When Jesus was riding in and people were worshiping him, it was seismic activity. It was like an earthquake. It was like everything came together in one place at the right time. And so we celebrate this day when Jesus rode in openly and he's riding in on a donkey. Uh, I remember some years back, I uh, was at a, at a, I think it was a pastor's conference and he uh, chose these verses and he was saying how he was raised on a farm. And they had livestock on the farm. And he said, I don't know how many of you here are familiar with donkeys. But for Jesus to ride in on a brand new donkey that had never been written before, that's a miracle. <laughs> that in and of itself is a miracle. And then he went on to share these words that I won't forget. Oh, that we had the same devotion in our hearts and obedience in our hearts as did that little donkey. God, make me a donkey that I might carry forward in my life the risen Christ. That donkey did what we should do. Everybody should see that donkey and just get in line. Lord Jesus, I want to carry your name forward. I want to be obedient. I want to be calm. I want to be submissive to you. I want to not worry about what my will is, which is what donkeys do usually. <laughs> no, I don't want to go that way. <laughs> and I'm going to sit down right here, you know. But not this little donkey. It's like he knew somehow within him that he was carrying the Lord of glory. I'm carrying. I don't know if donkeys smile, but I think that little donkey might have smiled. <laughs> I'm carrying the Lord of glory. Oh, that we were like that. Rather than, ah, oh, not another Monday. Not another chore. When the night before or the evening before, we were like praying what? Oh, God, make me a servant. Lord, I will serve you. Lord, I want your will in my life and not mine. And then Jesus, through somebody that we know and love, says, carry out the trash. And we go, what? <laughs> it's not about, you know. Daniel and I have shared, and he brought it up the other day. Everybody wants to be a servant of God until you're treated like one. <laughs> Amen? Amen. <laughs> but not this little donkey. He knew something special. And in an absolute um, act of honor, let's call it, the disciples then throw their coats and their clothes on this little donkey to make a more comfortable ride for the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I just, you know, it brings to my mind that old hymn, All to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. You know that old hymn, don't you? I think sometimes, though, if we actually sang that in all honesty, it might come out more like, half to Jesus, I surrender. <laughs> Partially, I give to him. 
Oh, let that not be us. Let us be like this beautiful little donkey. The crowd, actually a throng of people, they also began to throw their coats on the ground. And, and again, I, I look at, at circumstances and acts such as this, and I think to myself, it is beautiful when somebody abandons themselves for Jesus. Sometimes we're worried about what people might think about us, so we don't say anything. Let's be truthful. And sometimes we got to push ourselves, right? And sometimes we even know when God has set it up for us to say something, don't we? It gets quiet. The person's quiet. You're there. The Holy Spirit says, go on. Tell them your testimony. And you get a blah, 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 blah. You know? And we just, we just freeze at that moment. You know, uh, you know for years now, Jeannie and I... Uh, when we go to a restaurant, uh, and now some of the other guys in the church are doing this as well. Whoever's uh, waiting on us, some, some are doing, shaking their heads, yes, we do this. Uh, we, uh, we just say, uh, they come with the food and, and we go, we're just about to bless our food. What can we pray for you for? You'll be shocked at the responses. They, they, at first you get shocked, and then they go, well, I just got a new job that I'm going to be starting. Could you pray for my job? Or somebody say, oh, my, uh, my cousin's real sick. We had something that we had never happened to us before when we do this, and we do it all the time. Uh, we were at a little restaurant called Moco Gente, and uh, the food there is delicious. And... Uh, we uh, said to the gal, actually Jeannie said to the gal, uh, we're about to bless our food. Is there something we can pray for you for? And she grabbed both of our hands and put her head down. And she goes, yes, please pray for me. And we were like, Jeannie and I looked across at each other like, wow, this is way cool. <laughs> One other time we had somebody sit down with us. <laughs> uh, another time. Let's see, at, uh, I can tell you this because we saw him last night. Our good friend Fernando over at uh, Supermix. I'm eating at all these Mexican restaurants. <laughs> and, uh, and we prayed for him and we asked to pray for him. The Lord led us to that. Uh, right when his son was killed crossing the street coming to see his dad. And uh, they had some faith, but not full faith at that time. And we were able to minister not only to him, but also to his wife. And they all come to faith in Jesus now. They go to Calvary Chapel, uh, La Mirada. Amen. And uh, who knows what doors God will open up for you when you just begin to abandon yourself. I don't care who sees me. I don't care what they say. I don't care what they do. Do you know Jesus? Can I pray for you? What? What, what might happen? You're just like that donkey carrying forth the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the people brought shouts of praise. And let me tell you where, they, where that came from. They're actually singing a song. Um, you guys are familiar with oldies but goodies? Okay, the real oldies but goodies, where are they? The Book of Psalms. Some of them are 3,000 years old. Now that's really an oldie but goodie. So they're reading from, they're singing the song from Psalm 118, starting in verse 26. They say, blessed is he, they're talking about Jesus writing in, who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. And the psalm continues. Let me read it, starting in verse 27 of 118. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Light has a name. What is it? Jesus. John chapter 1. Jesus is light. He has given us light. Bind the sacrifice. 
Who is the sacrifice? Jesus, with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. <laughs> I would have thought that if God's mercy would have run out, I would be the one to do it. Anybody else with me on that? <laughs> You're not going to run out God's mercy. Amen. It's not going to happen. This is Passover time. And at Passover, they would bring a lamb, right? And the idea was to bring a lamb without spot or without blemish. And that lamb was to be sacrificed for your sins. It was not a, to take away sins. It was only a covering for your sins. But who is the Lamb of God? That Jesus? Do you remember when Jesus was very first introduced? He was introduced by John the Baptist. And what did John the Baptist say when he saw Jesus? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Our Lamb is Jesus. He's not like the blood of bulls and goats and lambs. He is the sinless one come down from heaven. And when he shed his blood for the forgiveness of your sins, they're once and for all taken away. That's why Romans chapter 8 verse 1 can say, there's now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who likes to condemn us? The devil does, doesn't he? He's like, what are you doing there? And You don't belong with them and you're a sinner. And you know what? When Satan tried to say that to me one time, I said, you're absolutely right. <laughs> I am a sinner. That's why I need Jesus. <laughs> and that's when he'll flee. See, my battle is dying to self and getting next to Jesus, where I'll be sitting in my right mind, where I'll have my right connection with the rest of the world, where things that I thought were so big and so overwhelming, when I keep my mind stayed on him, he does to me is to keep me in perfect peace. I trust him in that. My dad, who loved the Lord and is sitting with the Lord now, he used to say at times, this too shall pass. Anybody ever heard that? Mm -hmm. He said that because he trusted the Lord for everything in his life and for all the troubles that I brought him. <laughs> <laughs> this too shall pass. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. <laughs> Amen, brothers. So Jesus is riding on this donkey and he's riding toward the temple where it is that the lamb is offered. Makes sense. He's on his way to the temple. He is going there where all these people he has taught from the temple and he has healed them all at the temple grounds. And when he gets there, he sees what looks like a swap meet. where people are trying to bring their sacrifices. And it was a gimmick because the priests would look at their sacrifices and they would say, oh, that's unacceptable. You need to bring a better sacrifice. Here, if you'll give us some money, we'll give you one of ours and you can sacrifice that. What do you think that did to Jesus? Telling people that they weren't good enough to come with whatever they had. He got angry. He got so angry that, talk about meek and mild Jesus. I don't think he would have wanted to be in his way at this point. Because he starts flipping over tables. He starts grabbing people and throwing them out. And he says, my father's house shall be a house of prayer but you have turned it into a den of thieves. 
See how keenly Jesus is interested in what? This is a house of prayer. Well, what's prayer? Prayer is talking to God. That's my connection to God. Do you understand that Jesus is against anything that would prohibit you from having a conversation with him? Can you hear me now? <laughs> he wants that pure connection between you and him. And he'll go to battle. Which one, one of you said that your uh, scripture was that, uh, that uh, God is a warrior? Right on, brother. Uh, I think that I shared this this past Tuesday at Deep Challenge. I said, some places you go and they present Jesus and he is very, uh, he's very put together, you know. His, his hair is perfectly combed, you know. And there's a halo there. And he's just all dressed in white and nothing wrong with that. But so often when I go to Teen Challenge and sometimes here in the church family, I don't see Jesus that way at all. When I see Jesus, brother, he's wearing camouflage outfit. He's got a Rambo thing. <laughs> and he is ready to go to battle for you. Why would we ever withhold calling on him? Why would we withhold? He's standing right here. He's right here with us now. He said, whenever two or more are gathered in my name, what? I'm right there in the midst. I'm right there. He's right here, right now. He's not distant. He's right here. Amen. He's right there with you, right next to you. Amen. When Paul the Apostle got thrown into jail and... Uh, he had 40 guys standing outside that had sworn an oath that they would kill Paul. They wouldn't eat or, eat or drink until they had killed him. And what happened that night? Jesus stood by Paul. And he told him, cheer up. It's going to be okay. You've been my witness here. And now I'm going to send you other places to be my witness. It was like a big, don't be afraid. It's like I'm right here. Do you know the word, the verbiage that was used when Jesus told his disciples, go get that little donkey. He said, if anybody says anything to you, tell them the Lord has need of him. And they'll let the donkey go. Listen to me. Jesus looks at you. Jesus looks at me. And he says to the father, let him go. I have need of him. Whatever it is that holds you back from full on serving God, you're to know Jesus' word is, let him go. I have need of him. Jesus has need of you. He wants to use your life. He wants to bless your life. Whereas Satan wants to use up your life wastefully. He's, he's a one trick pony. All he does is kill, steal, and destroy. Right? And so what, what, he's a robber. He's a taker. And God's a giver. We're done, with, we're done with the taker. On to the giver of life, the giver of light, the giver of wholeness, the one who takes even the things in our past that were ugly, even those things that the enemy thought he would use to kill us. When you come to Jesus, he says, let him go. He's mine. She's mine. I have need of them to use their lives in a very blessed way. What was his purpose in riding into Jerusalem? I want you to check this out now. I mean, why do that, you know? Would there be some other way, you know? Uh, 
riding on a donkey on this day and people singing that. What, what's that all about? What's the bottom line of Jesus riding in on what we call Palm Sunday? Can I tell you that it was to make clear what he did was to make clear, was to establish, was to make a public claim to show his right, to show his prophetic fulfillment. He was saying as he rode in, I am the Messiah. I am the Christ. I am the King of Israel. I am the Savior. That's what he did. Matthew later on confirming to us this very thing said it's a fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 one of our scripture readings today Zechariah many hundred years before the birth of Christ said rejoice greatly O daughter of Zion shout O daughter of Jerusalem behold your king is coming to you he is just and having salvation lowly and riding on a donkey a colt the fold of a donkey and did you know and I'm not going to go into the math somebody very good at math in our church is Dave Clark you can ask him afterwards but in the book of Daniel it exactly pinpoints this day as the day Jesus would show himself as the Messiah, exactly pinpointing this day. And when the religious leaders, who did Jesus have the biggest trouble with? The religious leaders. When the religious leaders began to, I could just see them seething, looking at Jesus on this donkey, everybody worshiping him. They were like, tell them to be quiet. How dare they worship you? That was the idea. By the way, who's worthy of worship? Jesus. Jesus, God is the only one worthy of worship, right? I'll tell you, if Jesus wasn't God, which he is, he missed a golden opportunity to say, oh, stop worshiping me. But when they told him, Tell everybody to shut up. <laughs> Jesus simply answered them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. He was saying to them, this is me, this is what I'm seeing. He was saying to me, you guys are dumber than a bunch of rocks. <laughs> because if everybody shut up even for an instant the stones would begin to worship him what does that tell us in our lives God is going to have his way God's will is going to be completed Jesus said Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Every single little thing that's said in God's word will come to pass. You can count on it. Every time Jesus speaks, he hits a home run. His batting average is a thousand. <laughs> Everything that was said about the coming of the Messiah has come true exactly word for word, exactly the way it was stated. So how sure do you think it is of his second coming? And all these people who missed it, all these religious people who said, I know the word. I've been taught since I was a child. I know that. No, no, no. It's not about that. Apparently, these guys knew the word inside and out, had some entire books of the Bible memorized. But do you know him? Do you know him? Is he literally your savior and your Lord? That's where the rubber meets the road. Jesus rides into his capital city, Jerusalem. He rides into the temple 
as a king bringing peace, which was the manner of that day. The streets of Jerusalem are here shown open to him. Wide open. Come on in. Like a king moving into a palace, which is just what it'll be like at his second coming. Can you imagine us there with Jesus during the millennial reign? We'll look across at each other. Bro, how you doing, man? It's Jesus. Shane, we made it. <laughs> We're here with Jesus. Oh, I can hardly wait. More real, more real than us being here today is the reality of when we stand with Jesus at his second coming. Now, we're living in this time of grace. And Jesus' kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. Uh, as I said already, it's wonderful to see them praising Jesus. Uh, they were worshiping him as God because he is God come in the flesh. He is God with us. I want you to notice that as of this date, Jesus is no longer saying to his disciples, keep quiet. Tell no one. No, no, no. At this point, he's saying, sing it out loud. I am receiving your praise and your adoration. As well, the spreading of clothes and of palm branches was an honoring display of loyalty to the kings at that day. This as well as an act of agreement as to who Jesus is. When you lift that palm branch, when you say Hosanna, you are acknowledging who Jesus is saying he is by riding in on that donkey, on that triumphal entry. They welcomed him. Unfortunately, many of them welcomed him. Catch this now as a temporal conquering warrior that's what they wanted they wanted someone to lead them in a political revolt they ignored jesus saying my kingdom is not of this world somehow they forgot that they wanted, as I believe many want today, they wanted heaven on earth, on a fallen earth. What does that look like for us? Lord, let me, let me just win the lotto. Then I can get that brand new Tesla. And I can move to that beach house. Lord, give me an easy life. See, a lot of people are looking for a conquering temporal leader to make their lives easy. They have misplaced their own affections for Jesus as affections for self. Look, uh, the battle between the spirit and the flesh, it, it goes on, doesn't it? It, it doesn't stop. And I could even guarantee you, from this point forward until your very last breath, your flesh is going to put up a fight to have its own will and its own way. But the thing that leads us on as believers in Jesus Christ, as literal followers of him, is to want his glory, his will, his way above our own. And for that, I am willing to let go of the comforts of this world. I've come to the realization over years of walking with Christ that God is far more interested in your character than he is in your comfort. Look at the disciples. Look at, uh, I, I think I heard that the, uh, the young adults are in uh, 1 John. Did you know they boiled that guy in oil? <laughs> and he didn't kill him. 
Why? Because God wasn't done with him. Did he mind? No. Did it hurt? I'll bet. But there was something bigger. Believer, there's always something bigger going on. We have to seek God and ask him for what the bigger thing is. Some of us are at work and we're saying, why am I here? Maybe it's because the people around you need to see what Jesus looks like under a pressured job. Why did this happen to me? Maybe because God somehow will work it for good and will use it so that your life can bring him glory. A lot of you have said today, I want to see what God can do. Look, for me, maybe you agree with me, I've already seen what I can do with my life. I didn't like it. Now I am enjoying seeing what God can do with my life. And it's just awesome. Jesus, you're going to let me talk about you to people who don't know you? Wow, I get to do that. Awesome, Lord, I love it. I get to pray for people? Wow, this is crazy. I get to sing praises to you. I get to know who you are. This is, this is profound. When you think of all those who don't know. So this group of people that were so bent on worshiping him that day. Just a few days later, the Hosannas had all gone away. And what they were left with was crucify him. Crucify him. And yet how wonderful to hear from the Lord Jesus Christ. No one takes my life from me. I give my life freely. He gave his life freely for you because he loves you. I like to think of Jesus speaking to the Father and looking at me and saying to the Father, I want that one. And somewhere in eternity past, Jesus spoke to the Father and he said, I want you. I want you. I want you. I want you. And I'm willing to die in place of your sins. So, Real quickly, as I wrap it up, what do we see in this account of the triumphal entry is a bunch of contrasts, just like our own lives, just like today. Contrasts back and forth. The Lord of glory, God himself in human flesh comes. And how does he come? He comes lowly. He comes kindly. He comes with a goodness that causes us to seek him for love and for forgiveness and for newness of life. I take note that he didn't ride in on a stallion. I think that he should have rode in on a stallion. I'd have put him on a, on a big, big white stallion, you know. But no, he comes in on a donkey that he had to borrow. It's not even his. When he returns, he'll come in on a stallion. And then his robes. I look at his robes, and they're not royal robes. But yet, when we see him again, it will be in all his splendor. Today, we do not see Jesus as some kind of a conquering force, as do worldly kings or political leaders. No, he comes by love. And he comes by grace. And he comes by mercy. And the giving of his own life for us. Jesus declared again, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down freely. His kingdom today, here, with us, is one of humility. One of servanthood. He reaches hearts and minds today. He offers not temporal peace but he offers eternal peace with God. You see in the triumphal entry, his desire is to enter into hearts and lives forever to be changed. 
there to reign in peace and to reign in love. And as his followers, we then begin to display the same to the fallen world around us so that the world can see the mighty King Jesus living in each one of us. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand up. Father, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you, Father, for my dear brothers from Teen Challenge. I, I, I just, Father, feel, feel honored to be with them. I feel honored to be with, with Shane Parr, Lord. I, I just thank you for his life. I pray, Lord, you continue to lead him and guide him, Father, in the way that you have. Lord, you have much work yet to do in his life. I see that, Lord. We all do. And in each one of the lives of those who are here singing for us and giving their testimonies, Lord, you have much work to do through them yet ahead. Bless them. Protect them from the enemy. Use their lives for your glory and for their good. And if there be any here today that have been holding out on serving Jesus completely, I want to give you that opportunity to bow your heart before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's just a simple prayer. In fact, I ask you all to say it with me. Just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, Father, you know me, me, and I desire to know you. You know know my sins, sins, past, present, and future, and and your blood takes them all away. away. Lord Jesus, Jesus, be my Lord. Lord. I'll praise you as my Savior. And I'll walk with you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you, and may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord himself lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And may you this week walk in humility like that little donkey in obedience, in calmness, in resolute decision to want the will of God above all else. For all that we've done here, Lord, the word, the worship, praise the fellowship, the meal we're going to share in a moment. And I know we ran long, Lord, but it was all worth it. In Jesus' name. Praise God for...